Man has always measured time with the development of civilizations, technology. This measurement has become more and more important and more precise than ever before. Welcome to the atomic clock, a clock that only loses one second every three billion years. How do you build a clock that remains synchronized over time and space? A pendulum swing that is so accurate that you are able to measure the smallest changes in the most basic element of the universe. You use the atoms and their structure to build the clocks. At the birth of the universe, the Big Bang, the universe's element were created. And the atom in each element group are completely identical in their structure and their characteristics. Every cesium atom has the same number of protons and the same number of electrons. In the same way, a strontium atom will always have 38 protons and 38 electrons. So if you take a strontium atom from the Earth and compare it to a strontium atom from somewhere else, you will find that they are completely identical. This makes atoms unique in connection with clock making. If you imagine the electrons orbit around the atom's nucleus as a kind of a pendulum, you have the essence of the quantum mechanic heart of an atomic clock. A heart that today beats with such a regularity and stability that it would have lost only one second from the birth of the universe some 30 billion years ago to present day. Today we use the cesium atom as a basis for the definition of the second. The natural vibration of a cesium atom has a frequency of approximately 9 gigahertz. That is to say, the electron swings back and forth 9 billion times in one second. Or you can choose to see the vibration of the electron as 9 billion swings of a pendulum. So by counting the number of cycles an electron makes in one second, we can divide time into very small pieces and thus measure time with enormous precision. Today we are working with new and more rapidly oscillating atoms that oscillate at a frequency approximately a million times faster than cesium. In other words, the new clocks divide the second up into bits that are a million times smaller than the cesium atomic clock. This is the equivalent of going from a measure of weeks to a measure of seconds. But to build atomic clocks we have to go back in time back to 1913. In 1913, Niels Bohr described atoms quantum mechanically and was one of the first to do so. Quantum mechanics is a theory that describes the world of atoms and electrons, with some surprising results as a consequence. Bohr's model was comprised of electrons that orbit around an atom's positive nucleus. The electrons can only be in certain orbits called stationary states. These orbits represent the electron's energy state. The first orbit is the electron's lowest energy state. The next orbit is the electron's next energy state, and so forth. Bohr's theory also states that the electrons can jump from one energy state to another by either emitting or absorbing light equivalent to the energy difference between two states. But how do you control atoms that are in constant motion? And motion that impedes the desired measurement of the electron's resonance. Such measurements are of crucial importance when you want to build atomic clocks. When the atoms are in motion, an ordinary and very familiar but undesired physical phenomenon arises. The so-called Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is the term for change in the resonant frequency of an atom when it is in motion. Perhaps you know this phenomena best from your everyday life. When an ambulance is in motion and approaches you, it is not just the sound level that increases, it's also the frequency that changes. You hear the high pitch of the siren of an approaching ambulance. Conversely, when the ambulance is moving away from you, the pitch drops and the tones become deeper. That is to say, the frequency, the resonance frequency, decreases.
And it's precisely this phenomena where the resonant frequency is changing that affects the atomic clock as it will distort the frequency of the clock. So how do we control an atom that is in constant motion and remove the unwanted doubler effect that makes the atomic clock inaccurate? You capture the atoms in a light trap and cool it down to near the absolute zero at minus 273 degrees Celsius. This you do by using laser light. Such low temperatures calm the atom's restless nature. What we see here is a cloud of ultra-cold strontium atoms that we have trapped and cooled in the laboratory at the Niels Bohr Institute. The cooling and trapping of the individual atoms is accomplished using an intense laser field. A standing wave of light creates tiny cells and pockets. Each cell or pocket has approximately a width of 50 billionth of a meter. Here the atoms fall down into small pockets where they cannot escape as long as the intense light wave is maintained. At the same time, the atoms are put under pressure in their cramped cells. And it's actually this pressure that removes the unwanted Doppler effect. This is a quantum phenomenon that emerges when the atom is kept localized in a little cell with dimensions smaller than the wavelength corresponding to the resonance transition. When the atom is locked in its light trap, and the Doppler effect and other undesired effects and phenomena are eliminated, the next challenge is to find the resonance transition of the atom. Electrons in atoms are picky. They only emit and absorb certain wavelengths, and the wavelengths are different from atom to atom. Fortunately, some atoms' electrons have a very precise resonance, and this makes them suitable for atomic clocks. In order to hit this specific resonance, we had to build a very frequency-stable laser at the Niels Bohr Institute to set the electron of the strontium atom in motion. If you hit the atom's resonance with an extremely precise and stable laser, the atom will emit light in all directions. Some of this light can be detected by sensitive detectors, and clever electronics can send a message back to the laser that the wavelength is just right at this moment. If the wavelength of the laser changes or drifts, the light intensity will drop, and the electronics device will again send feedback to the laser, which will immediately pull back the wavelength of the laser to the electron's resonance. In this manner, the laser is locked to the electron's resonance. But why do we need such precise clocks? With the extremely precise measurements, that the latest atomic clocks allows us to make. We can test our fundamental laws of nature with an unprecedented accuracy. It could also open up new fields of research. For example, we could begin to map out the gravitational field on Earth, an area we would like to learn more about, by comparing two atomic clocks located at different places on Earth. You can measure the geoid, the Earth's gravitational field, very precisely. A shift by the clocks of just 10 centimeters in the gravitational field corresponds to a fractional change in the clock's rate of 10 to minus 17. Atomic clocks go faster the higher they are located in the gravitational field. In this way, we could examine substances found underground, like oil or gas or gold, as the composition of the subsurface affects the geoid, the local gravitational field or we can begin to examine whether the predictions of general relativity hold. Are there gravitational waves in space? Waves that are emitted from, for example, heavy double star systems. These waves pull and twist length scales on the ground here on Earth a tiny bit according to Einstein's theory of relativity. And with very precise measurements of length, that is to say, very precise measurements of time, we could have the first direct evidence for existence of gravitational waves. But perhaps the most interesting, will we be able to test the standard model? Will our present laws of nature hold? Do our natural constant drift over time? Atomic clocks are extremely sensitive to changes in the constants of nature. So by comparing two atomic clocks based on different atoms, 
You can test whether, for example, the fine structure constant or the ratio of the electron to proton mass changes over time. And perhaps the results would be revolutionary because the fine structure constant plays an incredible large role in the physics and our picture of physics today, as it dictates how light and matter interacts. That is fundamentally the way we perceive physics. Today we have a clock that only loses one second every three billion years. And the future for the precision of atomic clocks looks very bright. Perhaps we will be able to increase the precision of the measurements by a factor of 10 within the next few years, creating clocks that can form the basis for future research, new knowledge about ourselves, our world, and the universe surrounding us.